Right. Um, thank you to all of you for coming along this evening at 5.30. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first of our keynotes this week for the Level 2 Achieve More 10 Billion program. And I'll say a few more words about that in a moment. First, a couple of housekeeping things which I've rehearsed because these are the bits I always forget. Number one is we're not expecting any test fire alarms. So if an alarm does go off, it means we do have to evacuate the building. And if you could just leave by the back and follow the signs, that would be perfect. Thank you. And the second point is that the event is being photographed. Um, and if any of you don't want to appear in any of the photographs. Could you just make yourselves known to um, one of the people on the team, please, at the end of the event? Um, and we've got mechanisms in place which mean that you won't appear in any of the photographs that are taken. Okay, so there are people at the back you can have a word with. Thank you. Um, we're also encouraging social media um, engagement with these talks. We do have a hashtag. It's hashtag Chef10BN, Chef with one F. Um, so if you are twitterly inclined, please do um, tweet some of your comments as the um, talks progress. And for more information, you can also look for 10BN uh, on Facebook. Um, there's a group, and we also have a blog. I think if you just Google Sheffield 10BN, you'll find access to all of our platforms quite easily. Um, so for those of you... Um, who are visiting tonight and aren't second year students, I'll just mention that this is part of our Level 2 Achieve More program, which is an interdisciplinary program for second year undergraduates in which we bring together students from right across the university. So we're mixing up medical students with biblical studies, with philosophy, with civil engineering. So it's quite an ambitious program and in actual fact was conceived initially by one of our speakers, um, Paul White, who's um, here at the front right now, um, Achieve More was actually his brainchild, uh, so we're fortunate to have him here opening this event. Um, we decided to make these guest lectures open. Um, was that me? Am I blowing the place up? Okay. Um, so... Um, we decided to open up these lectures because I think we're very lucky in Sheffield to have some very eminent researchers and scholars, and certainly Tony and Paul um, will have plenty to say on demographics and the 10 billion. They're very inspiring speakers, and we wanted to share this um, beyond the walls of the university with you. So thank you very much, much for coming along. Um, the purpose of this first week, I think it's maybe the door at the back picking it up. <laughs> is, it, is it the peas? I shall, thank you. So, um, okay. So, the purpose of this week is to introduce the 10 billion program and the key issues that await us in a world where very soon we anticipate we'll have a population of 10 billion people. We're going to be looking at the effects of this substantially larger world population, the effects of an aging population, and all kinds of issues affecting humanity, health and technology, for instance. And this is something that Professor Marco Vicciconti will be talking about tomorrow. Um, we actually have keynote lectures every evening this week at 5.30, apart from on Friday when it's at 4 p.m. Um, with Danny Dawling. We're going to be looking at developments in law and justice um, and the International Criminal Court Judge Morrison will be coming along to the university from The Hague on Thursday um, and that talk is also open to Level 2 students, staff and students from the University of Sheffield so please join us for that. Um, on Wednesday we have Professor Jackie Labbe, who is the Vice President for Arts and Humanities at the University of Sheffield, and she's going to be talking about past futures and futures past. She's going to be looking in particular at the representation of increasing industrialization and urbanization at the turn of the 19th century in art and literature. So please do come along on Wednesday if you're able at 5.30, same venue, to hear Professor Labbe give that talk. And for tonight, um, could I please invite you to welcome Professors Tony Ryan and Paul White to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> so to your left, um, Professor Paul White. Um, Professor White has had a very distinguished academic career, joining the Department of Geography at the University of Sheffield in 1974. 
and rising to become a professor of European urban geography, as well as holding visiting positions at the universities of Paris, Cagliari, Zaragoza, and Oxford. Until 2015, he was the Pro Vice Chancellor for Learning and Teaching, and as I said, um, was really the brains behind the Achieve More program. In 2015, he received the inaugural Facult Faculty of Social Science Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Practice in Learning and Teaching. And Paul's research and standing in the field of geography have also been recognized. He was presented with the Royal Geographical Society's Edward Heath Award for contributions to research on the geography of Europe. In 2011, he was elected Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, and in 2014 was awarded a Senate Award for Sustained Excellence in Teaching for his work as an inspirational and innovative teacher in the Department of Geography. Um, Professor Tony Ryan, OBE, is certainly um, one of our most committed and prolific speakers uh, and academics within the University of Sheffield and indeed beyond. Tony leads the University of Sheffield's program in sustainability research across pure and applied sciences, engineering and social sciences. Tony is a professor of physical chemistry, polymer nanotechnology research and also public engagement in science and technology. He's the director of the Grantham Center for Sustainability Research and we're very grateful to the Grantham Center for all the support they've given us in the course of 10 billion um, in, co in the course of this program and the excellent events we're going to be putting on over the next three weeks. From 2008 to 16, Tony was the Pro Vice Chancellor at, for the Faculty of Science at the University of Sheffield. Um, so the theme of tonight's lecture is who are the 10 billion? How will we get to a population of 10 billion? And what are the key issues and dilemmas posed by this larger population? So without further ado, if we could invite Professor Paul White to the stage, who will begin this. Um, and I hope you very much enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tony and I first did this as a double act in Shanghai, as I recall, um, and we've done a double act on this, you know, once or twice since. Um, what I want to try and do is to convince you that there's a problem, and Tony will convince you that it's even worse than I say it is. Uh, so that's basically the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it. Ten billion seems a lot, because we're nowhere near there yet, but we're approaching it very rapidly. And what I want to, in a sense, argue is that it's inevitable. So, I'm going to start with, well, not all of you, actually, because we've got quite a number of people here who are not 19. I recognize that. It would be quite complicated to do this um, with the current population that uh, are in this room. But I want to go for, basically, the second-year students that many of um, you are in this room and make some predictions about how long you're going to live. This could be depressing, it could be exciting, dependent on which way you look at uh, mortality. Um, assuming you as a group of 19-year-olds in this room, i.e. in your second year, 19 and 20, if you experience the mortality that currently applies, that's the likelihood of death at each particular age group, female age 19 today, it's going to live to be about... Uh, well, I say dying in, but, you know, getting to 2081, 2082. It's quite a long way on. Males, of course, are the weaker sex, as you all know, and are likely to die three years younger. Um, so a male aged around 19 today can expect to live to around about 2078 or 2079. I'm going to make that better, actually, quite quickly, because what I've done there is use the death rates as they currently apply. But death rates are improving continuously in this country, and I'm basing this on the UK for the moment. Actually, if we make some reasonable predictions about that reduction in mortality and the way that that will continue over the next few years, if we predict mortality rates into the future, which means that they will diminish as we go through, I'm going to increase your life expectancy by about, about seven years. I hope you feel pleased about that. Um, so a female age 19 today is likely to live, given the improvement in mortality rates over the current period, to be about 91 and a half. And a male is going to live to be about 88 and a half. 
um, you can start planning on this, you know, pension schemes, whatever. Worth um, just thinking a little bit about it. But the point I'm making here is the 19-year-olds, the 20-year-olds in this room are going to live well beyond the midpoint of this century towards the very end of this century. Indeed, if you do this analysis today for babies born today with the likely expectation that mortality rates will continue to fall, you are starting to move towards a life expectancy for female babies born in 2016, 2017 of getting on towards 100. Now, in estimating your life expectancies, I've only got to produce some data and some predictions on mortality. When we look at population growth across the world, it's more complicated because I can look at the mortality predictions, United Nations, life tables, actuarial analysis gives us that, but we also have to predict what's going to happen to fertility, to births. And at first sight, it appears that that is much harder, at first sight. Both of those rates shift and move through time quite significantly. If we look at the um, world average life expectancy over a 20-year period, this is for the world as a whole, it's moved upwards by six years, from 64 and a half to 70 and a half. But the average number of children born to a woman around the world has also f um, changed quite significantly as well. 20 years ago, the average was just over three. Today, the average is two and a half. That's quite a big fall, and indeed, that decline in the fertility rate, number of births, is greater than the increase in the death rate. So you might say, well, people are living longer, but birth rate's actually falling faster. What's the problem? It certainly creates um, changes in the balance between old and young people. If we're having fewer young people and there is more longevity, it changes the nature of the population structure of countries and of the continents as a whole and the world as a whole. But doesn't it mean that the rate of world population growth will slow down? Well, to an extent, yes. Tony's got some slides a little bit like this as well. World population, top corner there, left 10,000 to 2,000 in the common era. We're now 2017. Kicks along pretty close to zero, you know, very small global population, and then suddenly a massive kick up in about, from about 1700 onwards. Changing the scale on the top right there using um, a logarithmic scale, recent world population trends, you can see there that in the period since about 1950, the global population growth has been about 1.7% per annum, much faster than it has been at any other time in recorded history. But actually when we start looking in more detail, the bottom left-hand graph there, the world population growth rate has started to fall during the most recent period, and it peaked around about 1960 to 1970 so that the rate of population increase at a global scale is now starting to diminish. And I put on there the vertical line because, of course, I don't know what the data are from there up to 2050. I am not a crystal ball, but we do have some reasonable predictions that are made by the United Nations and other bodies as to what is likely to happen into the future. And actually for the period from 1990 up to 2010, that line of decline has become quite steady. And that's quite important because that helps to add something about demographic predictability because people are not falling out of line in terms of what we might expect them to do based on what their older siblings or even their parents have done. So the argument that I'm making there in, in the yellow box on the right, the rate of growth is slowing down. It's about 1% per annum across the globe. There's only 7.4 billion people, I say only, only, it's quite a big number, isn't it? But there's 7.4 billion people in the on the world at the moment. Why is it going to get to 10? Why is the population of the world going to increase by a further 2.6 billion when the rate of increase is slowing down and it seems that surely 
that isn't going to be true. Well, what I want to try and show you is that demographically it is true. The United Nations makes predictions about the total population of the world, and they do this every few years, and they do it on a variety of bases, and this variety of lines on the right-hand side which splurge out up to 2050 are different estimates made on different bases for different time periods, and although there's one there that dips down by 2050 and ends up with a population of 8 billion, most of them rise to around about 9, 9.5 billion um, as the world population by 2050. That's 30 years before most of the 19-year-olds in this room are likely to shuffle off this mortal coil. Uh, in other words, you'll still be working at that point. Um, well, you'll be working until the day you do shuffle off this mortal coil because you're going to pay for the pensions of the people that, you know, you can see where we're going on that. This actually only goes to 2050, and you're likely to live a lot longer, those of you in this room who are second-year students. I'm not trying to worry you here. I'm just stating things as, as they're seen. If we look at the various estimations that the United Nations has made, and 2015 was the most recent detailed analysis of where the global population is likely to go over the coming period, the suggestion in the midpoint analysis there, the medium estimate, is that 10 billion will be reached by 2055. By the mid-2080s, that's the period when um, most of you are likely to live to, the world population will be about 11 billion. Now, there is a variation there. Some estimates are higher, some estimates are lower. But as the midpoint of these various estimates made by United Nations demographers, who are some of the most skilled in the world, I think we should accept that as a good starting point. Now, the key element in what happens in terms of population growth, and this might surprise you, is not death, it's fertility. That's the crucial element, because that is what's pushing a new input into the world's population. So it's really what happens to fertility that is the crucial element in predicting the future growth of the world's population. An awful lot will depend on fertility changes. Now, what I've done here is to produce um, a couple of maps. I'm a geographer. I like maps, you know. Um, it's part of the trade that one deals in. And what I've done here is to map the data for um, 2015 on the basis of, in the top left map, those countries in the world that have what we call below replacement fertility. Now, re below replacement fertility is assumed to occur when the average number of births to a woman is less than 2.1. It's more than two it, to allow for a certain... Uh, death and so on before the children themselves will move into and complete their own childbearing periods and so on. As you can see there, much of the world today has below replacement fertility. Every country in Europe, for a start, Canada, United States, Soviet Union, China, Iran, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Uruguay, and a whole host of small nation states as well, Cuba. I mean, Cuba's not a small nation state, but it's only just about visible on there. A large part of the world today has below replacement fertility. In other words, one generation will not be replaced by a generation that is the same size or larger. It will be a smaller generation in the future. But there are also many parts of the world in which fertility remains above two and a half children per woman on average predominantly in Africa, but not exclusively in Africa. Some parts of the Middle East, particularly in Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Oman and so on. Some parts of um, Central Asia, you see Mongolia highlighted on there, one or two parts of the um, Pacific Rim, Bolivia, Paraguay, Ecuador, a few cases in Latin America as well. But predominantly, this is an issue in Africa where fertility remains relatively high in comparison with other parts of the world. But 
we shouldn't take the fact that fertility is very high today as meaning that it can't change. There has been remarkable change in family building practices in some parts of the world over a very short time period. From the purposes of looking at generational change, probably in the West, we're used to thinking of the intergenerational interval as about 30 because the average age at which a woman gives birth to ch a child now is around 30. In some European countries, it's well over 30. In other parts of the world, it's around 20, the intergen intergenerational age. So let's look at a 20-year change. If we do, we find that there are a fair number of parts of the world where fertility falls of one child per woman over 20 years have occurred. So where one particular set of women have four children, their daughters have three. And that is really quite profound. Rapid change. And there are some parts of the world, which you see again here, Ethiopia, um, Yemen, Oman, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, some parts, uh, Nepal for instance, but also down there in Laos and Cambodia where there has been a fall of two children per women over a 20-year period, which is really quite remarkable. Women who may have been producing five children, their daughters produce three. So fertility can fall quite rapidly. It can shift uh, very significantly. Today, nearly four-fifths of the world's population lives in countries with low fertility. That's 5.7 billion people. But notice it's the majority of the world's population lives in countries with low fertility. And in these countries, you've got an average of two children per woman. 22% of the world's population live in countries with high fertility, 1.7 billion people. And in those countries, there's an average of four children per woman. But in most cases, that's falling. How fast is it falling? But the other question about those countries which have low fertility is a curious one to many people. These countries that have got low fertility actually are still experiencing population growth. Why is that? If they've got low fertility and it's below average fertility, it's, it's below replacement fertility, why are they still growing? It seems counterintuitive. The answer really simply is that demographic change takes a human lifespan to occur. It takes 80 years, 90 years, if we're looking into the future, for certain demographic changes to work their way through the system. So what I want to try and do is to illustrate, and here we get some numbers, and don't worry too much about the numbers. Um, they're good numbers. I like numbers. Um, just try and get the message of how this works. <coughs> These are low fertility countries. At the minute, about 5.7 billion people live in low fertility countries, and I've divided them into 20-year age groups. So in the low fertility countries, we've got about 1.67 billion 0 to 19s, slightly more 20 to 39s, because there was higher birth levels in the past. And then it diminishes down to three quarters of a billion people who are 60 to 79, and 0.14 billion aged 80 and above. Right, let's roll that forward to 2035. Now, if we've got replacement fertility, let's call it, you know, 2 or thereabouts, 2.1, we're going to have the same number of 0 to 19s. But look what happens as the existing population structure in 2015 rolls on by 20 years. So it moves into the next 20-year age group. As it rolls on, Mortality is pretty low in these places. We can effectively say that people don't die between the ages of 20 to 39 and 40 to 59 and so on. Yes, they do start dying when they're moving between 60 and 79 and 80. We've got to go sometime, haven't we? You know, but that starts to happen then. But what you're seeing here, although the number of children remains identical, total population increases. And it continues to increase because of the effects of what was already in the system. And if we take it forward to 2055, look particularly at what happens to the numbers of in the top age category, those over 80, we move from 0.14 billion 
to 0.72 billion, massive aging of the population. But also the total population has grown to 7.44 billion. That's in the countries that have got low fertility. The total number of people living in countries of low fertility by 2055 is likely to be the same as the total number of people living in the world today. Let's move to the high fertility countries, and here I'm going to make some heroic assumptions. Why not? You know, it's a Monday afternoon in February. Let's make some heroic assumptions. These are, this is the distribution of population effectively within the high fertility countries. There are very few people aged over 80. They do exist, but not very many of them. A minority of the world's population lives in these high fertility countries. But half of the population in those high fertility countries is not yet of childbearing age. It's age between 0 and 19. Well, okay, they are of childbearing age at the top end there, but a lot of them aren't. If we roll this forward 20 years, now this is where my heroic assumptions come in. I'm assuming 4.0 children per woman. No, not assuming, that's reality. That's what we've got at the minute in these countries. I'm taking some of the United Nations assumptions, which is that over the next 20 years, that might well drop to three children per family. If that were to drop to three children per family, we're going to get a picture rather like this. The population will increase quite rapidly from 1.64 to 2.6 because you've got this very large number of children who haven't yet had children themselves, and they do have children, albeit perhaps at a lower rate. But what that does is it shifts into the next 20-year age group, and we find that the population inexorably grows. And again, I'm going to make the heroic assumption that some United Nations predictions do, that let's say another 20 years, and that's actually dropped to 2.0 children. Let's assume that we've gone down to actually just replacement level by 2055. But the population in those countries has continued to rise because of the historic effects of what's been going on in the past, and that's now over 3.5 billion. So we've more than doubled the number of people living in what at the moment is the high fertility part of the world. And survival is likely to improve in the older age groups, so we're likely to move towards the start of population aging really occurring in those parts of the world as well. So if we turn this to look at the global population as a whole, and I hope you don't mind me putting these figures up, but in 2015, global population was 7.34 billion. It's, it'll be 7.4 billion now. Of that, 5.7 billion was in the low fertility countries and 1.64 in the high. That will shift, and we can be pretty certain about the shift, so it will continue to grow in low fertility countries, but it will grow at a lower rate than it does in the high fertility countries. And in this prediction, which is one based on United Nations data, although I've worked through some of the demographic implications of this myself, we move to a position of 11 billion by 2055. That's actually worse than the United Nations position, which is rather more optimistic and sees the figure of 10 billion not being reached until a little later than in this scenario because 10 billion is reached here sometime in the, in the 2040s. But the distribution between the two parts of the world will, be, will change quite significantly with high fertility countries seeing a more than doubling of their population over the period between 2015 and 2055, whereas the countries which at the moment have low fertility will see an increase in their population but they will not see a doubling. They will see it go up by around about 50%, a little bit less than 50%. So in low fertility countries, population growth continues because of the age structure, and in high fertility countries, it continues both because of the age stru structure and because of the high fertility, but much depends on the speed at which the decline of fertility, which is occurring today, continues. So what I've tried to show you is that 10 billion is inevitable. 
it will happen. Yes, there's only 7.4 billion people on the planet now, but 10 billion will come about because of the structure of populations in different parts of the world that we have inherited from the recent past. Well, I've tried to convince you that, but what I want to do in the last two or three minutes before I hand over to Tony, who's going to say it isn't just the numbers that matter, it's what they do. I've given his message there, but you know, he'll give it more interestingly than that. What I also want to do is just to suggest, actually, come on, let's be revolutionary. Let's try and envisage how we can stop the population getting to 10 billion if 10 billion is going to be such a disaster. i am called it inevitable. Are there ways that we could actually either stop it growing to 10 billion or defer it? And I think there are some roving mics, are there, somewhere? What I'd like to do is to put up for you four propositions. I call them provocations and just see what you think of some of these suggestions. So here's the first provocation. Many parts of the world have very high infant mortality rates or child mortality rates. Many parts of Central Africa, between 10 and 15 percent of all children die before the age of one. If we continue to put resources into reducing infant mortality, Aren't we increasing the rate of population growth in some of the poorest parts of the world? I'm being provocative here. I've got my tongue in cheek, but what I'm going to suggest to you is we should stop trying to reduce infant mortality and uh, child mortality in these parts of the world. We, should re we could stop resourcing programs to do that. Why not? Think for a moment, and then we'll run the microphone around and get some uh, opinions from you on that. And I'm going to put three more provocations in front of you and just uh, see what you come up with. So think or talk to the person next to you. They might be thinking as well. Just uh, see what you come up with. I would not be against reducing um, uh, infant mortality, but the birth control must be there at the alongside it all the time, or it's hopeless. Okay. Somebody further back who wants to add something in? I would be against reducing infant mortality, or about reducing the resources, but the other bit is clearly stop the children being born. I might be wrong on this, but I, I would have thought that um, if you think your children are going to die, you're going to have more children because those children are going to look after you when you're older. Um, there's something about once people feel secure that they, in the, that they will be looked after as they get older, they have less children. Yeah. Strangely, I understand the Green Party 
would regard this as not providing these necessary resources uh, as uh, racist, and therefore it's highly political. I wonder if somebody would pick up on that, because I've, I've already picked out one part of the world in that, in terms of the areas where you've got this very high infant mortality rate, to withdraw resources from certain parts of the world has huge geopolitical and ethical dimensions to it in relation to the populations that you are affecting by this. So that's you know, a crucial point. Let me move on to a second provocation. There's a small number of countries in the world will actually give us the bulk of global population growth. Out of the 200 or so countries in the world, only 26 of them will actually contribute 88% of the growth over the rest of this century. And you see there which countries they are. Nigeria is the one that is likely to grow biggest. India, Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania and Pakistan. I could go on, but I've just put the top five there. How about the United Nations offering very substantial development assistance to these countries in return for mandatory and enforced birth control policies limiting families to two children? How do you feel about that? Can we just get some other views people for a moment or two? And I'll try and pick, I'm sorry to do this, I'll pick other people. <laughs> Anybody that's got some views on this one? Here's one, uh, what one down here? I am from India, so I have to come in here. Um, so the gentleman from India here says declare an interest in it, but yeah, go so on. I've always thought about... Hold on, hold on, I've got a bit closer. Uh, I've always thought about uh, allowing the people, like certain uh, economic classes have different uh, fertility rates and mortality rates of children. So allowing the people with higher mortality, uh, well, sorry, low mortality rates to have kids and with uh, very low mortality, uh, high mortality rates to have less kids. So in this way, the population control can be. Yeah, so you're adding quite an interesting sort of social class dimension to this in terms of where the benefits and where the, the problems may lie. That's an interesting dimension. Trumpery. Let's <laughs> come in. Okay, well, let's move on to the third provocation, the third one I've got, which um, looks in a slightly different way. Population of over 80s will quadruple to over a billion, and that assumes that there will be continued progress in combating degenerative diseases. So, if 10 billion is going to be hugely problematic for the population, for the world to sustain, should we be actually not putting all our resources into extending longevity? Are we creating a problem for the world by trying to cure cancer, trying to cure neurological diseases, trying to cure heart diseases, particularly in circumstances where actually these over 80s are generally not productive? Yeah, so I've, I've always thought this. I've always thought everyone should have a set end date for their, for their, their death. So that everyone, because I often think part of, the, part of the annoying thing with funerals is that lovely things are said about you, but if only you knew when it was coming, you'd have held out a little bit longer so you could have been there in person uh, to hear the nice things that everyone had to say about you. So I think there is, I think there's a strong argument to, to give everyone a set date and say, all right, if you haven't already been knocked over by a bus or whatever by the time you get to 80, then that's it. Then they'll switch everything off. And I think, I, think it, I, think it, I think it solves all the problems. It requires a major uh, shift in, in the patterns of life and accepted patterns for everybody's life. 
um, and it becomes in its own way a right, you create a rite of passage along there, the final rite of passage. Um, but I think, it, I think it would solve all issues. Uh, and I think that um, then you could, you could ensure that there was even population growth across different age groups. Um, and uh, yeah, it would, okay. would give everybody a... I'm going to give you a name in a moment. We'll describe the name I'm going to give you. But anybody else want to come in on this one? Yes. Thank you, sir. You might have spoken. Didn't you have to call this gentleman who's already had a turn? And there's one over there cycling. Yeah. There's a couple of people over there. Yeah. 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 Perhaps I have the benefit uh, of youth when I say this, um, and although these uh, diseases do affect younger people as well, I think there is a lot of logic to potentially withdrawing um, research of these diseases and maybe looking into uh, diseases which more frequently affect younger people because, as you say, uh, increasing longevity is probably not as good as improving quality of life for people younger, teenagers, etc. Uh, I imagine some of these would require regulation of private health care um, and uh, with some of the other provocations I imagine that these policies would disproportionately affect the poorest in society and the wealthy would remain typically free to probably get around them some way or another. I just want to give you a name, if you don't mind, and that's the name Anthony Trollope. Anthony Trollope, famous novelist, actually suggested in the 19th century, in a book called The Fixed Period, exactly what you suggested. To foster euthanasia at the age of 80. Uh, Anthony Trollope actually wrote that. It's one of his best read books, um, particularly by the over 70s. But it's... <laughs> to uh, create a society that brings in population um, control, thinking about population, and it would reduce global population by one billion. I mean, this is my fourth provocation, but you've already started the ball rolling on that, but I can see others have got some views. There's one here, and then there's one up there. So can we take a gentleman who is hand up near me? Um, and then I'm going to stop because I really must hand over to Teddy Rump. Yeah, this gentleman there. Yes, uh, one provocation maybe to, s to come across or to bring across as well is that obviously the, most, uh, the biggest problem is that uh, the resource consumption in a world with 10 billion people. So it doesn't matter I, actually uh, who we cut, where we cut, we, we should really look at who uses the most resources and we should try to reduce there. So actually we have to start at our populations like developed countries and maybe not even the older people because they, I mean, if they're not flying around too much, um, in their holidays, of course, uh, they, they might live locally and so forth, whereas the young people like us um, are wasting an enormous amount of energy and, uh, and, and food and so forth. Um, so you could argue about that, you know, that's where we have to reduce. Yeah, thanks. One more. Um, I'll just throw the back one down in the middle up there, and I think we will move on because we want to hear from Tony Ryan. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. I'm a great Anthony Trollope fan. His uh, father-in-law embezzled the bank funds uh, of the Rotherham, Sheffield and Rotherham Bank, and then he married a girl from Rotherham. I don't know if that's got anything to do with them um, ending their lives at 80. Thank you. It's an interesting point, though. Thanks, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael used to be the librarian of the university, and therefore you can see that he has a very erudite knowledge of these matters. Um, what I just want to say, though, in reality, You've given good reasons against most of them, with the exception of the fixed period, where some of you have got some interesting views, but others are talking about uh, social injustice, about racism, about the implications of some of these provocations for the way in which we think about humanity. I would argue that, although I've given you those propositions, none of them is really tenable. Ethically, <coughs> politically, practically, I would argue that none of them is really a 
tenable proposition. And that means that the 10 billion that we've looked at a few minutes ago is going to be there, and in the lifetimes of those who are second year students, it is going to be present, and it is going to happen in your lifetimes, but it's not just numbers that matter, and it's what they do, as has been made quite importantly by um, people in the last couple of interjections, it's the way people consume resources. And at that point, I think I'll pass straight over to Tony Ryan for the second part of this. So, Tony, over to you. Good evening, everyone. So, um, I'm not going to be quite so provocative, or at least not in the same way. Um, So I, I, there, aren't, there aren't that many slides, those of you who are really paying attention. And, and, I, and I'll stand near the microphone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Fine. So, so my name's Tony Ryan. I'm from the Grantham Centre. Um, I'm, a, I'm a chemistry professor, and my views are very much influenced by that. Uh, that'll become obvious, because uh, I'm kind of simple. Um, only really interested in, in atoms and perhaps molecules and how they're distributed. Um, the Grantham Center works on, on issues of food, energy, and water sustainability because all those three things are inextricably linked for a population of seven and a half billion and, and will be so for a population of 10 billion because we're putting in enormous pressure on those food, water, and energy resources. So a couple of things I want to point out that kind of, you know, that you'll, see, you'll see graphs that look, like, that look the same. So, so I really like this one. Uh, it's not so popular in the White House these days. Uh, so this is uh, the, the year uh, over a millennium, um, and the ice core so the, the temperature from ice cores and tree rings in the historic, uh, and then the measured temperature, um, carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere past the Rubicon of uh, 400 parts per million forever uh, last year, um, and then the global population. Uh, and the issue is that um, this, this exponential rise in the global population means that no one born much before Paul lived through the Earth's population doubling in their lifetime, right? No, no one born before 1900 lived through the Earth's population doubling in their lifetime, right? It's just not supposed to happen. If we were any other population, it wouldn't have happened. You don't live, I mean, apart from Adam and Eve, Right? You just don't live through the population of your species doubling in your lifetime. And if you have, if you have bacteria growing in a petri dish, sure, that has an exponential growth until it consumes all the resources in the petri dish, and then there's no more food for the bacteria, and they start to die off. So there is another curve that looks like this one at the bottom, and it goes up and turns over, and it's flat, and then it goes down. And the issue for me is, where does it turn over, and how long is it flat for? So 2016 was the hottest year on record. And the reason is that we're putting enormous pressure on the Earth's resources because we live in a fundamentally different way to the populations that lived before 1700. So, so one of Paul's graphs had a change in slope of the Earth's population. Starting in, well, so 1750 is the year for me that the Industrial Revolution started. That's the year that more energy was imported in the form of coal into London than imported in the form of wood or charcoal, biomass. Right? And when we broke the link with the sun for our resources because we discovered buried sunshine under the ground, 
then the material wealth of our society could increase and the population could grow. And then this growth from 1930 through till 2000, you can see the change in slope in the linear, linear graph. And that change in slope was caused by something called the Green Revolution. So we use fossil fuels to get the Industrial Revolution going. And around the turn of the last century, so, so 100 years ago, the University of Sheffield scientists and engineers were concerned about food security because we couldn't grow enough food to sustain the population of the UK. Between 1800 and 1900, the UK's population increased by a factor of four because we started the Industrial Revolution. We got there first. We could feed those people because we had access to agricultural land all over the world in the colonies and the empire. When in the, in the 20th century, the Earth's population increased by a factor of four, we had to make the Earth more fertile because there weren't four more planets. And that was done via a thing called the Green Revolution that used fossil fuels to make fertilizer. And now we all eat oil, coal, and gas. And this graph is the Earth's population, which is the dark line, as a proxy for our fossil fuel consumption, world oil consumption, and the, dot and the dashed line is world fertilizer consumption. We burn gas to make fertilizer, to grow food, to feed people. And 3% of the Earth's energy budget, that's all the energy expended in human activities, 3% of it is making ammonia to make fertilizer. Consequently, because we're burning all this gas and putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the Earth's warming up. And I've been, at, I've been at the two most recent climate change talks and this, the goal of 1.5, that's already gone. We can't make changes quick enough to hit 1.5. So part of our problem is an energy problem. And the energy problem is an economic problem. Now, the fossil fuel anomaly is going to end. We will stop being. We, the, the fossil fuel age will cease. I was in Houston the other week talking to University of Sheffield graduates, and, um, and they were all in the oil and gas business. And one of them said to me, well, you know, we, th there isn't a peak oil. We can still keep getting stuff out of the ground, right? But the, the Stone Age didn't end because of a shortage of stones, right? The Stone Age ended because a better technology came along. And we need to be in the vanguard of providing that better technology that means we can rid ourselves of our addiction to fossil fuels. So for 10 billion people, we need about three kilowatts per person of energy supply. That's twice the embedded energy in your food. So that's 30 terawatts of energy supply for 10 billion people, which is about 14 terawatts more than we had four years ago. We've got to double our energy supply. And we need to get at least 25 terawatts of that from renewable resources. Now, we could do it with nuclear power. So at the moment, there are 439 nuclear power plants in 31 countries. There are at least 60 under construction in 14 countries. But to do it all with nuclear, we'd need to build 11,000 gigawatts of nuclear power, which means we'd need to build a new nuclear power station somewhere in the world every day for the next 30 years. And they have a 30-year lifetime. So when we'd built those, we'd have to start decommissioning the ones we'd built first and continue to build them. For a whole variety of reasons, that ain't going to happen.
I've just come back from the land of frack. Okay? Can we frack more gas? Sure we can frack more gas. So fracking, hydraulic fracturing. It allows you to access buried sunshine, right? All of these fossil fuels were once plants that were produced by photosynthesis absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When we burn those plants, we release that carbon dioxide back. So yeah, we can, we can frack more gas, and we can stop burning coal and stop burning oil and continue to burn methane. That produces less carbon dioxide per unit of energy, but still produces carbon dioxide. It's not an, we won't have a net reduction in carbon dioxide. There are many environmental concerns about fracking, most of which I don't buy into as environmental concerns. But the biggest problem for me is that cheap gas encourages complacency. And cheap gas encourages consumption. Consequently, you see all the, all the advantages of making more efficient vehicles that are lighter weight is eroded by people buying bigger, fancier cars with better air conditioning and more internal entertainment. So you actually end up burning more gas, even though you're making things more efficient. Those McLarens that are made down on the AMRC will not help us in any way, shape or form.